Just as applying the law of perspective to the horizon tells us that our Earth is indeed flat, the same principle applies to the setting of our Sun. The scientists liars of our world tell us that the Sun is 109 times more massive than the Earth and that it is 93 million miles away. They state that the split between day and night is because the Earth is rotating and that when we see the sunset we are witnessing the rotation and our arrival into the dark phase of the spin, which is a time frame called night and when our moon becomes visible. Much like the proposed curvy nature of our world and the theory of gravity, this is complete nonsense. Before turning our attention to the sun, let's first look at two examples that debunk the heliocentric model of a rotating globular Earth. The first is the New York City skyline as seen from Harriman State Park's Bear Mountain, which is 60 miles away. If the Earth was a spinning globe of 25,000 miles in circumference, then this viewing from Bear Mountain's 1,283 foot summit should be impossible. If we take Pythagorean theorem, which determines the distance to the horizon being 1.23 times the square root of the height in feet, then this skyline should be invisible behind 170 feet of curved earth. It should actually be beneath the horizon. Similarly, when ships pass the ocean's horizon, they should technically be vanishing over the curve of the earth. A strong camera lens, however, proves this to be false. Ships do not vanish over the curve of the Earth, but vanish beyond our limits of perspective. The law of perspective on a flat plane dictates that a receding object diminishes in angle and height until the line of sight converges to a vanishing point of what is called the horizon, in which the object then becomes invisible. The scientist liars claim that the sun sets and vanishes beyond the curve of the Earth. But this is nothing more than the sun moving beyond the vanishing point of perspective, which is determined by the limitations of our eyes, other objects and weather. The same law applies to how we see the sun and its rising and setting. The sun never rises or sets. It is an optical illusion determined by the laws of perspective. We think we see the sun rise and set because of the convergent and divergent nature of our line of sight. For instance, this row of street lamps appears to decrease in size further down the line of sight before vanishing completely, when in fact all street lamps are of the same height and continue to border the walkway well beyond the vanishing point. This is the same with this line of HP bottles. They are all the same size and they do not change size, it is just our perspective that makes it seem like they do. This is precisely what we experience when we watch the sun rise, set and journey across our flat earth.
NASA and many other liar magicians tell us our sun is 93 million miles from the Earth and 109 times larger than the Earth. However, amateur balloon footage taken from the clouds prove that the sun is not 93 million miles away or bigger than the Earth. What the footage shows is a locally illuminating sun cast in a localized hotspot over the Earth. If it were millions of miles away, this local hotspot would not be possible. Furthermore, if the sun was not a local illuminary, then we would not experience crepuscular sun rays. The angle of the sun rays that we see when light breaks through the clouds would not be possible. And we have thousands upon thousands of photographic and empirical evidence of the sunlight behaving this way. If the sun were 93 million miles away, then its light should form a straight beam and not be displayed in angled rays. If the sun is so far away, then why does it grow so much with just a small rise in altitude on Earth? At 93 million miles away, this rise in altitude should be negligible or non-existent. The change in size suggests a locally illuminating sun that is not an inconceivable 93 million miles away, but is actually relatively close to Earth, journeying just above the clouds. And it is not 109 times larger than the Earth, but actually a lot smaller than the Earth. Our first-hand experience of the Sun and the Moon is that they are nigh on equal in size and circular shapes that journey similar circular paths over our flat, stationary plane. The scientists' magicians make up these complicated theories of perfect spherical bodies of rock and gigantic balls of hot plasma that come with incomprehensible distances and calculations that bamboozle us. Anyone can use their common sense to discern that the Sun and Moon are of similar size. And the Moon is not a ball of rock. And they, and, uh, and they just start making stuff up. Yeah. Like that Neil Armstrong guy. Have you seen him on the talk shows? Neil Armstrong? You mean the first man to walk on the moon? Talk about a fish story! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, and they're buying it. Oh, yeah. 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 Many have studied the sun and moon's light. The sun's light is warm and drying. It preserves matter and prevents decay. If you leave fruits out in the sun, it will preserve them, like with sun-dried tomatoes and raisins. It is antiseptic and healing. The moon's light, however, is cold, damp, causes putrefaction and decay, and is septic. The sun's rays decrease the combustions of a bonfire, while the moon's light increases it. People have studied the temperature of the moonlight and were surprised to find that at night the temperature of direct moonlight is colder than the temperature of the shade. This proves that these two illuminaries are unique and opposites in nature. It also undercuts NASA's claims that the moon reflects the sunlight. If that were the case, then the moonlight should have a degree of residual warmth to it and not be colder than the shade at nighttime. Furthermore, the moon cannot simultaneously be a spherical body and a reflector of the sun's light. When light is shined upon a spherical body, it produces this. Reflectors have to be flat or concave to actually reflect. A spherical convex surface results in no reflection. Again, basic, repeatable, verifiable and real science works against a magician's space saga hoax. A lot of photographic and film footage also proves that the moon is semi-transparent. When the waxing or waning moon is visible during the day, it's sometimes possible to see the blue sky right through the moon. Sometimes at night it is even possible to see stars directly through the surface of the moon. The Royal Astronomical Society has documented many of these instances. Faith believers in the pseudoscience of the rotating ball often use the moon's surface as proof of the heliocentric model in which the moon appears upside down in the southern hemisphere and the opposite in the north. But again, this proves the stationary Earth. Time-lapse photography shows that it is the moon that turns clockwise like a rotating disk over the Earth, and this is only possible if the Earth is stationary and it is the moon itself that is moving. 
You see, the sun and moon and luminaries rotate around our flat disk Earth in a similar way to the hands of a clock, dictating time and seasons and the fluctuating balance of dark and light, preservation and decay. In fact, our flat Earth is the oldest clock of them all, and this is how solar and lunar eclipses are possible. The heliocentric model completely fails when studying lunar eclipses. For a lunar eclipse to take place in the globe model, the sun has to be reflecting the Earth's shadow onto the moon, and all three have to be aligned in a straight 180 degree syzygy. But since the beginning of time, lunar eclipses have been observed while both the sun and the moon are simultaneously visible in the sky. Furthermore, when looking into the mechanisms of a solar eclipse, the heliocentric lyre once again falls apart. As this footage demonstrates, the sun and the moon have to be roughly a similar size for a solar eclipse halo to form. Representing uh, my sun source and a penny representing the moon. And as you can see, the flashlight is a lot larger than the penny. Okay, uh, now let's place the sun 93 million miles out into space like this. Let's get our penny a lot closer to the camera. Okay, where well, it's about the same size as the flashlight in perspective. Okay, now that doesn't look right. You can't see the corona, and it just doesn't eclipse. You can still see it light all around. It does, it's not a, a total blackout. Uh, okay, now I have a side light on the side of this flashlight that just so happens to be the exact same size in diameter as the penny. Which is perfect for our next test because the sun and the moon are the same size on a flat earth. And we'll bring the sun in closer to us as it would be on a flat earth. Now let's try our eclipse with the uh, moon right underneath the sun. And wow, there's the corona. If the sun was 400 times bigger than the moon, then its light would devour the moon and we would not witness the halo or corona. If the earth was a rotating ball heated by a sun that is a distance of 93 million miles away, it would be impossible to have a boiling hot summer on a continent like Africa, but a few thousand miles away, absolutely freezing conditions in Antarctica which experiences no heat from the sun. As Eric Debay states, if the heat has traveled 93 million miles to the Sahara Desert, then it is absurd to think that it could not travel another 4,000 miles to Antarctica. This is a difference of 0.0004%. If the Earth was a globe, then the Arctic and Antarctic polar regions should share similar conditions due to their comparable latitude. However, this is not the case. Antarctica is the coldest place on Earth with an average yearly temperature of minus 57 degrees and a record low of minus 135.8 degrees. The average annual temperature of the North Pole, by contrast, is a mild 4 degrees. The Northern Arctic endures mild warm summers and survivable winters. The Antarctic is so cold and harsh the ice never melts. This would be impossible on a globular Earth rotating on its axis. Eric de Bay also points out that Iceland at 65 degrees north latitude is home to 870 species of native plants and an abundance of animal life. At the South Pole by contrast, as Captain Cook wrote, not a tree was to be seen. The lands which lie to the south are doomed by nature to perpetual frigidness never to feel the warmth of the sun's rays, whose horrible and savage aspect I have not words to describe. Even marine life is sparse in certain tracts of vast extent, and the sea bird is seldom observed flying over such lonely wastes. The contrast between the limits of organic life in Arctic and Antarctic zones is very remarkable and significant.
The sun's yearly motion from tropic to tropic, solstice to solstice, is what determines the length of the days and nights and the appearance of seasons. This is why regions on the equator experience almost annual summer conditions and the north and south latitudes experience more defined seasons with winters. The sun and moon do not just journey our flat earth in one large circle, but rather a series of circles, or what is better understood as a conical coil spring-like motion, which dictates the change in season and the length of the days. That is why it is possible to see a midnight sun in the Arctic, and time-lapse footage of this shows that the sun does not set, but circles the pole. The scientist priests lie and say this is due to the poles on either end of the spherical globe, and that Antarctica also experiences a midnight sun. But we have no amateur footage of this as no one is permitted to explore the region. And all official footage is highly suspect as either Photoshop or manipulated. Furthermore, if there was such a phenomenon in the Antarctic, then why does nothing grow there? NASA claims that the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles per hour around its central axes, traveling at 67,000 miles per hour around the Sun, and spiraling at 500,000 miles per hour around the Milky Way, while the entire galaxy is traveling at 670 million miles per hour through the universe. If this was the case then the North Pole star, or what is known as Polaris, should not remain a constant in the night sky. It always remains perfectly situated above the North Pole, despite all this motion and journeying. The word planet originates from the ancient Greek planetes, which translates to wandering or to wander. And the Greeks were correct, it is the stars above that are moving not us on our flat, stationary Earth. Look.
As you can see, Polaris remains a fixed constant in the middle and all the other stars turn perfect circles around it. If the Earth was spinning at a thousand miles per hour, the stars would be seen to travel more or less horizontally across the sky. But this is not the case. The stars form perfect circles above, emanating out from Polaris, and this can be observed all the way to the Tropic of Capricorn. The reason Polaris never moves is because the North Pole is the center of our flat and stationary Earth just like depicted in Gleason's map and the United Nations logo. So what are the stars above our heads? And if NASA is lying about the nature of our Earth, Sun and Moon, does that mean that space and the universe are also fake and not what we think they are? The short answer is yes, space as we know it is a hoax. Our flat stationary plane does not look like this sitting in space. We will look at what the stars are and the possible real space that our flat Earth resides in. But first we must venture deeper into a different rabbit hole. We have come a long way, but we have only really scratched the surface. This next rabbit hole is deep and dark, but it is necessary. And I promise you this, on the other side lies a comprehension of things so incredible in nature, you would not have thought them even possible. Follow me now to part 5, as it is time to understand the why of the lie.